And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you an in conversation with uh, poet, essayist, and um, travel writer Kathleen Jamie. Um, so I'll just give you a big deep background to Kathleen. It's, it's called in conversation, but it's very early you have a conversation with four people are staring at you. <laughs> Unless you can help in a bus and do this one. Uh, so, Kathleen Jamie is a multi award winning poet, essayist, and travel writer. She was born in Ernfrewshire, and whilst young, her family moved to Curry, just like outside of Edinburgh. She is the professor of creative writing at Stirling University, a post she has held since 2011. Prior to this, um, Jamie taught creative writing at St Andrews. Her love of poetry was nurtured through the theatre workshop group that met in Stockbridge in Edinburgh, whose numbers included Andrew Gregg and Ron Buckland. The poets introduced Kathleen to philosophy, which she went on to study at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so with regard to poetry, um, Kathleen was awarded Eric Gregory Award from the Society of Authors in 1981. And more recently, um, she won the Salter Society Book of the Year and Poetry <coughs> of the Year from the Bonius Company. Um, her composition was selected for the inscription for the National Monument at Bannockburn in 2014. As well as poetry, Kathleen is a well-known essayist and her writers include um, findings and sightlines, which were published by Sort of Books. And her memoirs include 1992, The Golden Peak, which was reissued in 2002 as Among Muslims, and in 1993, The Autonomous Region. And to sum up, um, Dr. Jules Smith says on the British Council Literature website, Kathleen Jamie's ability to combine critique and celebration, Scotland with the international view, humanity and nature, makes her one of the most urgently relevant of current poets. So put your hands together for Kathleen. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to kind of do a chronological, chronologically, chronological uh, <laughs> discourse through Kathleen's career. It's going to be punctuated by some poems that reflect on those periods of time, those moments in time. So what I'd like to first ask you is, what inclined you to join the theatre workshop and, and what, were the, what was the kind of feel and scene there of the writers and oh, poets? Oh, God, no. we're going back to... Mm, 19... OK, good. The late 1970s, it was a long, long while ago, and I was still at the school and starting to write and in a sort of secret way. I wasn't telling anybody. And there was a, a poster on the school wall which said something about the theatre workshop at Edinburgh. And in the small print, it said something about a writer's group. I can't remember any more than that, but I, I remember thinking I could go, I could get in a bus and go. The 52 bus would take me there. And, and so I did, I started going every, wherever, every week or two to this wee group. And so some of those people I met all these years ago are still dear friends. But they, they were the first real writers that I met, you know, living writers. And they were kind of bohemian, it was, yeah. you know, it was good. It was, um, yeah, it was giving me a sense that it, it, it was a writer was a thing that was possible to be because these old people who were about 23, you know, <laughs> they were doing it. Yeah. Now, you went on from there to study philosophy did, yeah. at university, yeah. and you said previously that it was a discussion of philosophy with the poets at the writers' group that yeah. kind of helped encourage you to, to study philosophy. Yeah, it wasn't a subject I'd heard of, you know, but I'm, I'm interested in these. Andrew Craig, particular, he was he was a philosophy PhD student at the time, and so understanding there was this thing in the world called philosophy, and, and here's one of my university mates, philosophy mates, just walked in, and um, that this is a, a thing that one could study, and I just didn't fancy it in English, yeah. in philosophy. Uh, but getting to university itself was the achievement, that was difficult, but you know, yeah. but then doing philosophy was, yeah, that's what I did. What you've said about philosophy, it kind of enabled an exploration of the history of ideas, how to spot an, an opinion masquerading as fact, teaches you a rigour, so. a bullshit detector. Now, do you think more people should be studying philosophy now? Oh, God, yeah, I think it should be. Every school, should be, every, every school should be doing philosophy, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. And if there was a creative writing course around at the time, would you have considered applying for that? Well, do you know, I was glad there wasn't. I'm, I'm glad I didn't have... I'm glad it didn't exist in the sense that I'm glad I didn't have to have that dilemma about studying creative writing. I speak as a teacher of it now. 
There was there was just no nothing, no provision at all. You learned um, in the wild, as it were, you know, not in captivity. And I'm glad I didn't have to even think about it because I think it would have put me into a flat spin. You know, can, can one be a writer without having done a course? And where do I do the course? And who's the right tutor? And how much is it going to cost? And how do I go back to my mum and dad and say? After the philosophy, which I know isn't law and I know isn't medicine, can I now do creative writing? I'm, I'm just so glad I didn't have to do that. <laughs> you, you also said that I had the big creative writing courses at the time, and they wouldn't stay in the direction of Sylvia Plath or Hugh McDermott. Do you think you would have confined your own personal reading? No, I think I was getting that anyway from Scottish culture at the time. Yeah. That might have been a reason to go out with where I wasn't and do it. I might have had more. Oh, do you know what I think it would have saved now is about seven years, and that's in the great scheme of things, it's not much. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have met other people different to the people I did meet, and read things different to the things I did read. So, yeah, is anything lost by not doing it? I don't know. So, um, the first reading we're going to do is The Graduates from um, the Collection Jism. Yeah, this, this is about that, that time of my life going to university and realizing that I was, I was the first one and the only one to go to university in my family, which is an experience lots of people in this room will have had. And I, I had the, the realisation afterwards that it was a bit like emigrating, although I stayed at home, you know, because you moved into a different social, a different language, a different social scene, a different job opportunities, but still, you were still in the same country, right? So the graduates. <clears throat> if I chose children, they'd know stories of the old country, the place we never left. I swear I remember no ship slipping from the dock, no cluster of hurt, proud family, waving till they were wee as china milkmaids on a mantelpiece. But we have surely gone, and must knock with brass kilted pipers the doors to the old land, we emigrants of no farewell, who keep our bit language and jokes and quotes, our working knowledge of coal pits, fevers, lost, like the silver bangle I lost at the shows one Saturday, tried to conceal, denied, but they're not daft. And my bright monoglot bairns will discover, misplaced among the bookshelves, proof rolled in a red tube, my degree, a furled sail, my visa. So um, when you were at uh, Edinburgh University, mm. which poets do you recall or recollect seeing Read live and recite live. Oh well, that that generation, older than myself, were, were, were still alive. So um, Edwin Morgan, Sarah McLean, mm. uh, Norman McCaig, I remember hearing all of them. To the extent that if I read their works now, I can hear their own voices. You know, mm. which is a, a great reason to hear a poet mm -hmm. doing yeah. their own thing. Mm. Uh, w. S. Graham actually turned up once to do an event, and um, so there's that, that generation, and a, and a slightly. Uh, God, I'm starting to think generationally. Somebody, Douglas Dunn was slightly younger, but I remember him as well. But definitely, th those people were all alive. Liz Lochhead was the only visible woman poet. Yeah. You know, and very, very dramatic. She's very visual. Mm -hmm. You know, so she was, she was a great thing to have around. So, um, the poetry you've named, the very good performers and performance poetry, nowadays is seen as an essential element of kind of a poet's makeup. Sorry, McLean, performance poet. I don't think so, I don't think him. Well, they were schoolmasters mostly, so they used to standing up and projecting. Yeah. But mm -hmm. having to do that performance thing that a lot of the young ones now do, I don't know, are they, are they obliged to? That certainly, it wasn't, it wasn't. It was an add-on. One had to occasionally give readings, but the idea of being a performance poet didn't enter our heads. So um, your first collection was printed when you were 20. Yeah. Um, how did you begin to get noticed in writing? Who championed your early writing? Uh, well, that, that book, Black Spiders, did, did... nobody told us not to, you know? <laughs> there, was no, there was no rules, you know? I heard. Somebody must have told me that this publisher, Tom Fenton, who lived in Morningside, was looking for manuscripts. So I thought, well, I've got this bunch of poems. And I took them in an envelope and left them on his doorstep. No email nowadays. You know. 
And of two weeks later, a postcard arrived back saying, yeah, I like them, let's do it. And I thought, oh, fine, that's what happens. But <laughs> 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 I, I went down to his house and he was more interested in, in paper than he was in poetry, I think. He was really interested in paper and the weights of paper and the colours of paper and, and the materials of bookmaking yeah. and the binding and the stitching. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lovely. And you've said it's easier to, to name a child than it is to name a poem. Well, sometimes. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the longest you've had to kind of consider for naming a poem? I couldn't tell you because once it's done, it's done. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next. Yeah. And for the collection, we also said that you know you find it almost difficult to, to write to the 50 oh, poems yeah. for a collection. Oh, yeah. You don't have any spare, like no. you know, some people make an no. album. Music <laughs> <laughs> no, I know one or two poets have got to throw things out. And yeah. <laughs> that never happens. Okay. Okay, so the next poem we're going to hear, hear is Alder from Treehouse. Right. So we've, we've skipped from age of about 20 to age of about 40. <laughs> Nothing much happened. <laughs> Alder. Are you really Alder Tree? In this, the age of rain. From your branches droop clots of lichen like fairy lungs. All weak squalls, tattered mists. Alder, who unfolded before the receding glaciers, first one leaf, then another. Won't you teach me a way to live on this damp, ambiguous earth? The rain showers released from you a broken tune. But when the sun blinks, as it must, how you'll sparkle like a fountain in a wood of untold fountains. Fantastic. Now, uh, that was performed by uh, an American choir that's in Giles Cathedral this week, yeah. from Concord, Massachusetts. Mm. Um, and I know you say that once, once you've written a poem, you have to, to, to let go of it. Mm. How have you found other art forms interpreting your work and their approaches to it? Well, it, it doesn't happen very often. And, and that um, American chorus, astonished me. Because at that point I was 20 years old and last year I got an email from yeah, a lady in the United States saying I'm, I'm the director of this, this chorus and we have commissioned a composer to set your three poems and we're coming to Scotland and we're going to be in St Giles and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and, and <clears throat> they, they just, they leave your garret and, and find their own way in the world and once in a while something like that comes back to you and it's, it's really, really quite wonderful. Yeah, I, th I thought it was interesting, the use of repetition. In, in the music? In the music, yeah. How long did that poem take me to read? About 20 seconds? Yeah, but you managed to turn it set, to, yeah. you know, it was, it was several minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I'm so not musical. <coughs> but I, I was trying to attend to what she was doing, as you say, finding spaces, and, and like a sculptor, finding spaces within the poem to go into and bring things out and go back there, you know. It's a totally different way of, of listening yeah. to, what, to what I was doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you were sitting there, did you, did you have a sense of a kind of appreciation of wonder what they did with it, or...? I was, I, I, I say it again, I, I'm deeply, deeply not musical, and um, I was quite... I wasn't very sure what I was going to hear when I went into St Giles. And I was just thinking, please, don't let it be that kind of squeaks and pops. You know, I just won't know what to do with it. But I could, I could tell it had, it had integrity and melody and, and things like that. Well, you said we like 20 years. In between at that time you'd visited northern Pakistan mm. and China, mm. um, you know, accomplished mm. travel memoirs. And can you explain a bit behind the motivation? Because you travelled to northern Pakistan alone and you travelled through China with a photographer. Mm. Can you talk about the motivation behind those experiences and the differences between travelling alone and having a companion with you? But again, we're going back quite a long way. Um, to 1989, I went to, to China and, and Tibet. And, and the impulse was just to get away and have an adventure, you know, a youthful adventure. Mm. And uh, yeah, just to get out there. And um, so I had been before to Pakistan because I fell in with some mountaineers and they were going to the big hills, K2 and Gashabrim, in, in the extreme north of Pakistan. And I went along for the ride, you know. And, just got more interested in the villages and the cultures I was passing mm -hmm. through than, than the actual mountaineering. So I did go back and in, it was 89, so we went into China and it was the time of the Tiananmen Square massacre. So China was in turmoil. K2 
came all the way back, long and journey all the way back to Pakistan and just thought, you know, Pakistan was the height of normality after China. <laughs> yeah. So stayed there for a wee while. So, um, what were your thoughts around the time of the Tiananmen Square massacre happening in China around ideas around freedom of expression and writers' responsibilities and the role well, of it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. That was how long ago? 35 years? And only this year, this spring, I got up my old notebooks that I'd kept and actually wrote a memoir about, about being there at that time. It's taken all that while mm. for me to... to come to a place where I thought, actually, there's things I want to write about and things I want to say about that. All that while. Decades. You know? You what see why I don't use Twitter, don't you? What was the trigger? <laughs> I can't remember. I think it was something really simple. I think I walked past somebody in the street or I smelled a smell that took me back to that, that place at that time. Uh -huh. I think it was as elemental as that. And what was your experience of the different Muslim communities in Pakistan, say, and China? Didn't count too many Muslims in China. Went to, the, went to Kashgar, which is Uyghur, which is Muslim, uh -huh. but just, you know, passing through. Yeah. So I didn't have any... Kind of comparator? No, I didn't have any, uh -huh. any meetings with them. And your experience of the Muslim communities, or, or women, female Muslims in North Pakistan? Well, I had a, I had a lovely time with them, a family who were, who were Shiite, <clears throat> and they were so astonished that I was there on my own, yeah. that of being female, I could be embraced within a family, and they immediately did that. A male on his own couldn't have crossed, literally couldn't have crossed the threshold. Yeah. But as a girl, the, the, the girls of the family who aged with me were able to bring me in. And we, you know, it, was, it was such a formative experience now, looking back. You still in touch with the family? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Facebook has been invented since then. So. <laughs> So yeah, just just and no more. And I often think about going back, but every time I think about it, some new ghastliness happens. You know? Yeah. It just breaks my heart. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the next poem that I'm going to read to is Overhaul. Mm -hmm. The Overhaul from the Overhaul. This is this this book uh, published in my late forties. Thinking this is my midlife, you know, midlife book, and uh, the Overhaul. Speaks to that. So it's a. Uh, yes. The overhaul. It's actually about, about a boat. That boat on the cover, which is a Shetland farine. The overhaul. Look, it's the lively, hauled out above the tide line, up on a trailer with two flat tyres. What? 14 foot, clinker built, and chained by the stem to a pile of granite blocks. But with the bow still pointed westward, down the long vaux, down toward the ocean, where the business is. Inland from the shore, a road runs, for the crofts scattered on the hill, where washing flaps and the school bus calls, and once a week or so, the mobile library. But see how this duck-egg green keels all salt-weathered, how the stem, taller like a film star than you'd imagine, is raked to hold steady if a swell picks up and everyone gets scared. No, it can't be easy when the only spray to touch your boards all summer is flowers of scentless mayweed, when little wavelets leap less than a stone's throw with your good name written all over them. But hey, lively, it's a time of life thing, it's a waiting game. Patience, patience. <laughs> Speaking of patience, uh, you said you haven't written a poem in three years. It's true. Um, <clears throat> this is the thing that happens. Is it, does it come a moment in time you actually think I haven't actually written a poem? Or is it just a kind of natural thing you just wait to feel compelled to it? There's, there's no option but to wait. Yeah. Because if you, if you try and force it, you just write absolute mince and then you get more <laughs> anxious about it. But then with, with the Bonnet's company, you kind of force yourself to write a poem. That's true, yeah. Uh, one a week over the, the whole year of the <coughs> kind of independence debate. Mm -hmm. So what, how did that inform your kind of writing style or having a deadline to, to write? I had to loosen up. It was fun. Though. Writing this book was fun. As you say, I, I challenged myself to write a poem a week. And to do that, I had to make certain... Um, sacrifices is too strong a word. I can show, I can show you physically. You know, to, these poems are a meticulous little exquisite little stanzas, you know, yeah. and I could fuss around with a, a comma in and out for you know, God knows how long. 
But in order to do one a week, that had to go by the board. And I just developed a much more loose, sort of freewheeling sort of style yeah. in a conversational tone, which carried it. Once you've got the tone, tone is everything. Once you've got the tone, it, you know, it can write itself. Were there any weeks you were thinking, God, this isn't, this isn't happening, or was it, did you find it quite liberating? This was liberating. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. And I had to go every Monday morning and think, <clears throat> writing a newspaper column, I suppose. I'd think to myself, right, what am I doing this week? And so I had to go, in my mind, go places I wouldn't have gone otherwise, just to find, to find the week's poem. You've also said that when you write, you imagine the reader behind you, behind you sharing that experience. Yes, with you. I don't give messages. I don't give lectures. I hope, I hope to God I don't lecture. You know, I'd much rather have... Mm -hmm. I'll say to students who start fretting about what does the reader think, I think, sort the reader. <laughs> you shouldn't have the reader in your in the garret with you, you know, because it is, it mocks up the relationship. The relationship is, is you with the poem, and if you imagine a reader at all, don't imagine them there facing me like you people are. Imagine them side by side behind you, saying, "So you're saying, look at this, that weird, yeah. you know." And what do I, you think of that? So. The Bonnie's Company was critically well received in Scotland when mm -hmm. the Salt Tower mm -hmm. Award did, yeah. Book of the Year. But there was a sense that it wasn't reviewed so extensively down in England. No. <laughs> 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 I mean, do you think it was because it was of the political time, or did you have any kind of. I couldn't possibly think comment. I think. <laughs> 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 uh, but as a writer, was it a kind of chastening experience? Do you think that you were speaking? It probably did me no harm. No. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to, to, to read a poem from the, the Bonnie's Company? Oh, yeah. it, it's, as I say, it's one poem per week through the year, so I'm, I'm going to read one for middle of July, which is roughly where we are just now, which is not set in Edinburgh or anywhere urban at all, but it's set away on the, in the Hebrides, the island of North Rona, which is as far in the Hebrides as you can get. And once you're on Rona, the northern facing peninsula that runs northwards and is bleak and beautiful. It's called Fianish. This is called Fianish. Well, friend, we're here again, sauntering the last half mile to the land's frayed end to find what's laid on for us, strewn across the turf. Gull feathers, bleached shells, a whole bull seal, bone dry, knackered from the rut. We knock on his leathern head, but no one's home. Change, change, that's what the terns scream down at their seaward rocks. Fleet clouds and salt kiss, everything else is provisional, us and all our works. I guess that's why we like it here. Listen, a brief lull, a rock pipit seeds small notes. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I was going to list the, the number of prizes, poetry prizes that you've been awarded, but yeah. I would have taken up the first five minutes of the conversation. What's your own particular personal opinion of the merit of poetry prizes and the kind of the nature of the competition amongst poets to to seek accolades? Do, does it benefit the the, the I think it's, it benefit? You. I think the, the the prize culture developed because there's just no money in the system at all, no yeah. money at all, and it seems. Um, so somebody somewhere will get five grand or ten grand sometime, you know. Yeah. It's just kind of daft, I suppose. I think that's why it grew, though. Um, the, uh, what's the word? What's the word when you... When you I don't know. The word's flown out of my head. The sort of accolade, the, the verification. Kind yeah, affirmation, yeah. The affirmation, yeah. yeah, of course that does you. That does great things for you, yeah. To live your life as a poet with no affirmation must be killing. Yeah. But there's 101 poetry prizes at the minute. Isn't there? Not, not yeah. big ones for collections, but individual poem prizes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Masses of them. And I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure what the purpose of that is, or if it's a good thing for a writer, a young writer, a beginning writer, to be thinking about the next competition. You know, yeah. It seems an odd relationship to, to have with your own Poems. So when poets get together, is, is that a topic that people oh, talk about? So it's one that's kind yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was speaking to a young, a student.
quite recently, and she was talking about about affirmation and how, where, how, do you, how you guess it, where it comes from. And I said to her, what in your mind is affirmation? And she said, being shortlisted for a prize. That was it. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, what was your response healthy? to that? What did you think? Hmm? What did you think? What was your advice to them at the time? I don't know, I'm still wondering, is, yeah. it, is that healthy or is it just the way it is? Yeah. Maybe something we can look at in the Q&A section. Now I said earlier that the line of inquiry often is, what is it we're just not seeing? Mm -hmm. um, now you've said that um, earlier in the writing you were looking at the voice of the poet, but um, through the years you're more attentive to what, what the poet is listening to. I think it's a sign of age, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think so, you're encouraged. Um, Early on, to, to find your voice, as if it were missing. Find your voice. I remember a student of about 19, say American student, saying to me, yes, I write, but I've yet to find my voice. I thought, go on, you are 19, it's okay. <laughs> and, uh, it, seems, it seems to have gone actually as a fashion. But I just got interested in this business of, of voice and finding your voice and giving voice and speaking for your tribe, mm -hmm. you know, which is a whole different set of questions, yeah. you know. If you are black, if you are transsexual, if you are, on my day, if you are a woman, do you have to, to speak for that, be the voice of that constituency, mm -hmm. you know? And if not, why not? It's, that's a whole other realm. But eventually I got sick of the sound of my own voice, you know, and I thought, no, I just want to listen, actually. Which is why I'm glad I wasn't shunted into performance poetry at a young age. Yeah. yeah. Just spend some time listening. So with the kind of recent events taking place in Manchester and with Grenville Tower, there's been some notable poets that have been writing in response mm -hmm. to, to these... Mm -hmm. ...the kind of incidents. Yeah. So, so, have you ever felt compelled to write to such a situation or not a in theme. Egypt, I say the Tiananmen Square thing. Although it wasn't in Beijing, we were many, many miles from actual Beijing. Beijing, yeah. but that's taken me thirty years of thinking about that, yeah. thinking about atrocity, thinking there's been actually no end to atrocities. Yeah. And how? That's what my piece is about. What is the role of a writer or a poet? You know. Mm -hmm. And I have no answer. The piece is about having no answer. Yeah, you talked about like, 30 years after Tiananmen Square, but it was 700 years after the Battle of Bannockburn that we came to write a poem to that. Um, That's true. Yeah, so, I mean, it's such a great honour to have that, you know. Yeah. Depends on your kind of, how you view bat battles and wars and independence and so forth. You said that you were writing to the kind of community of Scotland with, with that piece. And Firth of Scotland, And, yeah. and Firth of Scotland. Can, can you talk further about how the commission <coughs> came about and... Uh, 2014 was the yeah. 700th anniversary. Yeah. yeah, you're right, it is yeah. quite a long while, isn't it? Mm. And I don't know if people are familiar with this, this rotunda thing, it's a big sort of sculptural thing they have at Bannockburn. And 50 years ago it was, it was erected, and they always meant to have a poem inscribed on it, but they never got round to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, it's slow and <laughs> And so it was thought it would be good on the anniversary to have finally get the poem together. And how did it happen? A number of poets were asked to um, submit poems. And we did. And through various things, mine was the one chosen actually to be writ. You know, that was this big, on this, this oak beam, which is in a circle. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah. So when a poem has a kind of place of permanence mm -hmm. and it's linked to a, a historic memory, mm -hmm. did you feel kind of the weight of responsibility with that, or having been chosen, or...? I like the poem still. I think, I think the poem stands up. And I, was, I was concerned when writing it to um, make it physically robust. I went and sat there and looked at this, this beam, the sculpture thing, for quite a long while, and, and felt, tried to feel physically how the poem would have to stand there in, 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 the, in the rain and the wind. Yeah. You know, it would have to be quite chunky. But I was also very concerned to... to make the poem have the tone that it now has. The, the visitor centre at Bannockburn is all full of claymores and medieval warfare and blood. And yeah. God, people are going to come out of their heads diddling with medieval warfare. That's, that's enough, enough. You walk up the hill, you come to this thing, my poem is going to say something quite, quite different. You know? And it certainly wasn't going to be a nationalistic week of the English sort of thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's going to be... 
So, um, it'd be a delight if you could actually read from um, Here's a Land. Yeah, Here's a Land as well. So, you have to imagine it's written larger, just in a big. I keep doing that, it does this big thing. Here lies our land, every eight beneath swift clouds, glad glints of sun, belonging to none but itself. We are mere transients who sing its westland winds and ferny breeze, northern lights and siller tides, small folk playing our part. Come all ye, the country says, you win me who take me most to heart. Oh. So what I think we'll do now is hand over for a, a Q&A session for about 10-15 minutes and we're going to wrap up with another reading from Catherine and Jamie. So if people could put their hands up if they've got any burning questions they'd like to ask. I came to your poetry through your prose. Uh -huh. And what I've been hoping ever since is that you'll come out with another volume of essay. Is that on? How did that happen? I'm 10,000 words away from finishing it. <laughs> <laughs> the 10,000 words of your house. It's just <laughs> very, very sticky. And if you can suggest a title, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> 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 but it was actually a delight writing um, for the current publisher for the essays because they give you the freedom to, to write about whatever you want without giving you a deadline. Yeah. Can, can you talk about the different processes of writing to, to deadlines and, and being given that freedom? Um, I've never really written to deadlines. No. It's not something I can do. And, and the work is not, um, doesn't make so much money that the publishers are desperate to have it. You know? yeah. So they can quite freely say, oh, take another year, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and what's, a, what's the difference of writing to prose and writing to poetry, the kind of writing creative prose. technique? And... Um, I took up writing prose because I thought it has to be easier than writing prose. <laughs> I thought, I must, if I write prose, teach myself how to do that. I can surely sit on my, on my desk at like nine in the morning, work away until one o'clock, and that would be me for the day, and it would be done. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is it is easier, but you can't. I can't force it any more than I can force the poems. Yeah. Do you do you read the the stories to, to anyone to get an idea of? Quite often it's difficult to. Do. It's no, easier to understand no, where a poem would end, but no, they're kind of really, messy. No, no, I like to just noodle away at them until they're done. Yeah. You know. So you say you write in the morning. Is there been yeah. times when you burn the midnight oil with writing prose? Or? Yeah, but I'm not much use. <laughs> No, I'm definitely a morning person. I like the idea of being bohemian and writing through the night and that, yeah. but it just doesn't, doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, anybody got, got other questions? Um, I liked what you said about listening rather than the voice, mm. listening to yourself or something. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what part it is of you that is writing, is it always the same part or is it different parts? What do you mean? Uh, well, I'm a psychotherapist, so <laughs> yeah. when, when, when you were saying that listening to yourself, I was just wondering if it was a, what part it is, and is it always, is it a poet, is it a, is it a woman, is it? I don't know. I don't know. Why would a psychotherapist ask that? I wonder, do you, do you <laughs> identify different parts of a yeah, person? Yeah, uh -huh, I think so. Yeah. Like archetypes or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think the next stage is? So, you know, initially it's about the voice, then it's about attention and listening. Do you think there's another phase that's going to come? In the making of a... a yeah, I feel like you yeah, understand the poetry that, and appreciation of poetry. There's, there's the, the, whatever comes first. I don't know. In my, in my practice, if I'm going to write a poem, something occasions it. And then I get the back of an old envelope and I write down the most unbelievable mints, but that's okay. And then I leave it by for a wee while and then I have that delicious feeling that there's something in there that I want to get at. And then comes sometimes a quite long process of working it and redrafting it and that's where the listening comes in. Listening to what the poem wants to be, not what I want it to be, but what, it, what it's seeking to be and what it wants to say. So it's not my voice at all, it's, it's the poem, yeah. you know, coming out. And I've got to be attentive then and work with the poem to bring it into shape and bring it into form. 
and that's that's lovely. It's delicious, mm. you know. And that can take, you know, any number of redrafts and thinking and many weeks mm. until it's done, and then then we go our separate ways, and it goes off and becomes a piece of music in America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you reading at the moment? What am I reading? I am. Um, the poet I read most recently, with most pleasure, was Kafafi. And mm. um, why? I don't know. I just picked him off the shelf. Mm. And I am reading a bit of Neil Gunn. And so I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm visualising the bedside table. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've just been given to review a book about Robert Louis Stevenson and Samoa, which I'm looking forward to. Do you, do you read poetry when you're writing poetry and read prose when you're writing? I tend poetry? not to. Sometimes, if I'm writing, I can sometimes fixate on one particular poet and read only that poet for quite a long time, you know, to the exclusion of everything else. And it's just having an affair with this, this poet, and you know, that's, that's all I want to do. So I don't, I don't read widely, I don't read in a very Catholic way. I tend to just walk into something. And just uh, reminded me when you were asking when people ask you for the <coughs> message. I remember Norman McCabe saying, if you're looking for a message, just go to Tesco's. Sorry. Okay, yeah, question in the back. Sorry. Um, do you feel any differently when you're writing about your children? Do you feel a different kind of responsibility? Um, that it's a different kind of subject matter? No, they don't. They don't come into my work very often. Isn't? Yes. Did it? Did it feel any different or just different to what? Subject? Different to any other subject. Well, I just wondered if you feel a different kind of responsibility because it's a different kind of subject. I'm interested in the word responsibility. Well, you do feel responsibility, don't you, when you write? Mm, yes, I don't know. Um, um, the child that you mention is presently driving through Belgium on the way to the Alps, so it was a long... I know, but I don't have to jump a bit. I can have to that. I can't remember. I can't remember. I think the responsibility I feel in all the poems is, is to get it right. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't bring the family into my work terribly often. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. No. Were any of your children compelled to write? No. No. <laughs> not the least. Not at all. Not at all. No. Um, so if you could have a conversation with the 20 year old poet who had the first collection published, what advice would you give Ooh. on your quote? Ooh. Oh, that's a one. I don't know if I would presume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you do think some of the younger poets now feel like they're being hustled into certain areas of poetry. I wonder. But you kind of had that freedom yeah, then to explore possible. different areas. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, the, the performance poetry thing, I wonder if people are being directed, you know, who ought to be, people who want, really want to be quite lyric poets in the garret and mm. being, being sent out there to do the voice thing. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, I'd have to ask, I'd have to ask younger people. Yeah. And given the nature of, say, funding for yeah. students these days, the, you said it was really supportive that you were, you were getting a grant to go yeah, to university, university and then you could sign on afterwards and there was kind of support for artists at that time and that's kind of disappeared yeah, now. It's almost like a privilege to be an artist now. Or yes. Almost like an entitlement. Um, yes. How do you think the direction of travel will be for the quality of writers that are coming through and the different voices that are coming through? Well I think that's, that's, that's a very good point. If, if, if we've established that the only way to become a writer is to do a postgraduate university course at great expense and a PhD, then you're always going to shrink the number of people that that's available to. I, I, I don't think that'll happen. I think literature will always out, yeah. you know. But if we can't get writers coming off the factory floor, as we used to, then that's a cultural yeah. disaster, actually. Okay. 
Any, any further questions at the back? Um, it's a question more about your essays. Um, you wrote a very impassioned review of a certain male nature writer, um, <laughs> which I thought kind of hit the nail on the head for me of what my issues around nature writing um, was at the time. But I just wondered, there's been this movement of new nature writing in the past few years, and I wanted to know your opinion on that, and do you think it has changed, or what, what you see in that new movement? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was this thing called new, new nature writing for a few years. I'm just wondering if it was just a moment that's that's gone. You know, I don't know if it's going to sustain. I don't know. Okay, so we discussed labels, like being labelled as a nature writer, oh, as a nature writer. Yeah, I'm old enough to have quite a lot of things. Yeah, that, how do you feel about being labelled as a kind of a nature writer? As long as you don't do it to yourself. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because that, then you're shutting down all your opportunities for other possibilities. You know? Maybe say to yourself, I can't write about Tesco's because I'm a nature writer. You yeah. know? <laughs> Maybe the next thing you really want to do uh -huh. is write about Tesco's. That's not impossible. <laughs> Um, yeah. um, I'm very interested in that, you know, you were talking about Simon McLean and Norman McKay, you know, could include, you know, George Mackay, Brian, all these people. Uh, because none of these people had uh, gone to workshops, and uh, neither did uh, Charles Dickens. And uh, it interests me, because I know a few writers these days, who um, go to workshops and who write books and whose editor sends them back, and who then they uh, write again, and the editor sends them back again. And in the end, it's a bit like, you know, workshopping plays, workshopping anything. I wonder who is the author in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a, I just find it odd that that's the way things have gone. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I sort of think, well, who wrote this now? I think if you, you have a that? good editor, hmm? I think if you have a good editor, you're very lucky. They're very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And it's a relationship that's just as, as precious as, as... Yeah, they're very, very hard to find. And somebody that you can have that dialogue with, back and forth, back and forth. A good editor will help you become, help the book become what it can be, you know. I think they are on some, you're right, the names don't appear on the spine, maybe they are, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that, that intensity of discussion, I don't find it with anybody else. You know? God, I couldn't. <laughs> um, I don't have a question, um, but I do have a suggestion that you were asking earlier. Um, for a title. Um, and I don't, I, I've always thought of a very simple thing, and I think, how about just more words? More words. <laughs> i tell you what, I've got, to, I've got to deal with my, now we're at the title stage, I've got to deal with my editor that we do not react physically to each other's suggestions. <laughs> I promise not to be offended if you do. <laughs> Okay, got time for two more questions. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I mean, the gin and tonic, I think we're pretty good. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to conclude with a, with a poem. Yeah, we Decide could. which one. No, I haven't. I'll just have to endow it. Unless there's any requests. I'll just open the book. <coughs> ah, some stags. The stags. So we're up in the Cairngorms now. This is the multitude, the beasts you wanted to show me, drawing me upstream, all morning up through wind-scoured heather to the hill crest. Below us, in the next glen, is the grave, calm brotherhood, descended out of winter, out of hunger, kneeling like the signatories of a covenant, their weighty, antique, polished antlers rising above the vegetation like masts in a harbour or city spires. We lie close together, and though the wind whips away our man and woman's smell, every stag face seems to look towards us, toward but not to us. We're held 
and hold them in civil regard. I suspect you'd hope to impress me, to lift to my sight our shared country, lead me deeper into what you know, but loath to cause fear, you're already moving quietly away. Sure, I'll go with you, as I would now, almost anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you put your hands together? So I have to do some thank yous. Um, tonight's event is going to be a pre-record for the Scott Lip Fest, which is going to have a hashtag Scott Lip Fest on Twitter. And uh, that'll be taking place from the 21st to the 23rd of July. Um, from the Salt Test Society, we need to thank Sarah Mason and Ashley Stein. And for, from 404 Inc, who are producing uh, Scott Lip Fest, we have to thank Laura Jones and Heather, Heather McDade. And I can speak personally from this from the point of view of the Scottish Poetry Library. The work that Scott Litfest does in the Salter Society is absolutely fantastic, reaching new audiences. I think there's about 3 million people access Scott Litfest online globally last year. Wow. So, you know, it's fantastic for yeah. promoting and making Scottish poetry accessible and writing accessible. So put your hand together for the Salter Society and 404 <laughs>